Hello class, this is chapter 37, Transport Operations. And in this chapter, we're going to be discussing knowledge of operational roles and the responsibility to ensure patients' public and personal safety, as well as that of your crew. Now with these educational standards, we will be discussing EMS operations and your operational roles as far as your responsibilities to ensure public, patient, and personnel safety. The principles of safely operating a ground ambulance will be covered and among that the risks and responsibilities of emergency response. We'll also be discussing the risks and responsibility of transport, including air medical, which involves safe air medical operations, and the criteria for utilizing air medical response. We will also discuss medicine as it applies to fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency medical care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. We'll also discuss infectious diseases, the awareness of them, and how to decontaminate equipment after treating a patient. We'll also discuss how to decontaminate the ambulance itself and equipment after treating a patient. Now, to introduce early ambulance operations, originally horse-drawn ambulances were used in major U.S. cities throughout the late 1700s. U.S. hospitals started using their own ambulance services in the I'm sorry, in the 1860s. Ambulance attendants traveled with limited medical supplies, whereas today's ambulances are stocked with equipment, including state-of-the-art technology that can transmit data directly to the emergency department. Today's emphasis on rapid response places the EMT in greater danger while driving to calls. Although technology can aid in directing the route, and mode of response of the ambulance, it is also distracting and potentially places the crew at higher risk for crashes. With the emergency vehicle design of today, an ambulance is a vehicle that is used for treating and transporting patients who need emergency medical care to a hospital. The first use of motor-powered ambulances occurred in the late 1800s. Today's ambulance designs are based on NFPA 1917, which is the standard for automotive ambulances and on suggestions from the ambulance industry and from EMS personnel themselves. An enlarged patient compartment is one of the most significant developments First responder vehicles respond initially to a scene with personnel and equipment to treat the sick and injured until an ambulance can arrive. Components of the modern ambulance include a driver's compartment, a patient compartment big enough to support two MTs and two supine patients, equipment and supplies to provide emergency medical care at the scene, and during transport. There are also the advantages of two-way radio communication, and there are also designed and construction design that ensure maximum safety and comfort. This table below shows basic ambulance designs. This is table 37-1 in your text and I encourage you to learn this table completely, and we are going to discuss them. 
Each state establishes its own standards for ambulance licensing or certification. Many states use federal specifications. The Star of Life emblem identifies vehicles as ambulances and is often affixed to the sides, rear, and roof of the ambulance. Local or state regulatory authorities determine which emblems may be displayed on the side of a pre-hospital care ambulance. These figures show the different types of ambulances, and these were outlined in the previous diagram that I showed you two slides ago. Now let's discuss the phases of an ambulance call. An ambulance call has nine phases. First is the preparation, dispatch, en route, arrival at scene, transfer of the patient to the ambulance, en route to receiving facility, which is transport, at the receiving facility, which is delivery, en route to station, and post run. Now let's discuss the preparation phase. Make sure that equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. Items are missing or do not work are of no use to you or the patient. So new equipment should be placed on an ambulance only after proper instruction on its use and consulting with the medical director. Equipment and supplies should be durable and standardized. Store equipment and supplies in the ambulance according to how urgently and how often they are used. Place items needed for life-threatening conditions within easy reach at the head of the primary stretcher. Place items for cardiac care, external bleeding control, and monitoring blood pressure at the side of the stretcher. Make sure that batteries are fresh and equipment is functioning properly. Cabinets and drawers should have either transparent fronts and or be labeled and should be opened easily and also that they should close securely. To continue in your preparation, you have to make sure you have proper medical equipment, including all of your basic supplies. Those are disposable gloves and sharps, airway and ventilation equipment, basic wound care supplies, splinting supplies, childbirth supplies, automated external defibrillator, patient transfer equipment, medications, communication equipment, and other regionally appropriate supplies. You'll also need airway and ventilation equipment including oral pharyngeal airways for adults, children, and infants, nasal pharyngeal airways for adults and children, and equipment for advanced airway procedures if authorized by state regulations and your local medical director. Two portable artificial ventilation devices that operate independently of an oxygen supply must be on board, and you must have pocket masks, bag valve masks, and follow local guidelines in identifying specific ventilation equipment to be carried. One portable and one mounted suctioning unit, large bore non-kinking suction tubing with semi-rigid tips available, and a suction yoke and an unbreakable collection canister, a suction catheter, water for rinsing suction tips, suction tubing, and all parts must be disposable or made of material that is easily cleaned or decontaminated one portable oxygen supply unit, and it must be located near a door or in the jump kit. You'll need a minimum capacity of at least 500 liters of oxygen, equipped with a yoke, a pressure gauge, flow meter, oxygen supply tubing, non-rebreathing mask, and nasal cannula. It should be able to deliver oxygen at variable rates of 1 to 15 liters per minute, and have at least one extra portable 500 liter cylinder on your ambulance. One mounted unit with a capacity of 3000 liters of oxygen and it should be equipped with all should be equipped with visible flow meters capable of delivering 1 to 15 liters per minute. They should be accessible at the head of the stretcher, 
transparent disposable oxygen masks with and without non-breathing bra- non rebreathing bags in sizes for adults, children, and infants. Ambulance services that undertake runs lasting longer than one hour should consider disposable single-use humidifiers. You also need CPR equipment and a CPR board that provides a firm surface under the patient's torso and establishes an appropriate degree of head tilt. If unavailable, use a long or short backboard. Use a tightly rolled sheet or towel to raise the patient's shoulder three to four inches. Do not use the roll to hyperextend the neck if you suspect a spinal injury, however. You also need mechanical devices that deliver chest compressions and ventilations that are also available. You need basic wound care supplies, including trauma shears, sterile sheets, and sterile burn sheets. You also need adhesive tape in several widths, self-adhering soft roller bandages like Curlex, for example, sterile dressings, gauze, abdominal or laparotomy pads, sterile universal trauma dressings, sterile occlusive non-adherent dressings, adhesive bandages, and tourniquets. Continuing with your preparation phase, you need to make sure you have splinting supplies, including adult and child-sized traction splints, and arm and leg splints, e.g. inflatable, vacuum, cardboard, plastic, foam wire ladder, or padded board. You also need triangular and roller bandages, a short backboard, a long backboard, head immobilization devices, cervical collars in adjustable size, or a variety of sizes, child birth supplies, at least one sterile emergency obstetrics kit, including surgical scissors, hemostats, or special canal clamps, or cord clamps, excuse me, umbilical tape, or sterilized cord, small rubber bulb syringe, towels, gauze sponges, pairs of sterile gloves, plastic wrap, sanitary napkins, plastic bag, baby stocking cap, baby blanket, and then you need to make sure you also have, of course, an automated external defibrillator, an AED on board. And you can have also semi-automated defibrillation equipment. It depends on how you're supplied. And there are manual and monitor defibrillators that have automated external defibrillation capacity. So make sure you're aware of your local protocols and local medical director directives. With patient transfer equipment, you need to make sure you have a primary wheeled ambulance stretcher that fastens to secure the stretcher firmly to the floor or side of the ambulance during transport. There should be at least three restraining devices for the patient. And then there should be other devices such as a scoop stretcher, portable folding stretcher, flexible stretcher, basket stretcher, and then you need a wheeled stair chair a long backboard and a short backboard or a short immobilization device like a KED. As far as medications, you need to have appropriate medications that have not expired, telephone number and radio frequency of online medical control or local poison control center on the ambulance. You also need a jump kit that should include portable, durable, and waterproof and it in it in this five minute kit you need anything needed for the first five minutes with the patient, except for the AED. It should be easy and open to secure. And its typical contents should be disposable gloves, face shield or mask with goggles, triangular bandages, trauma shears, adhesive tape, universal trauma dressings, self-adhering soft roller bandages, oral pharyngeal airways, bag valve mask with mask for adults, children, and infants, a blood pressure cup, a stethoscope, pen line, pen light, sterile gauge dressings, and sterile dressings, and also abdominal pads. And it should also include adhesive strips, an oral glucose, activated charcoal, and other medications that are approved by your local medical director. You also need to have safety and operations equipment. This includes several kinds of equipment for responder safety, rescue operations, and locating emergency scenes. This personal safety equipment should be personal protective equipment for exposure to blood or other bodily fluids, face shields, gowns, shoe covers, and caps, including turnout gear, helmets with face shields or safety goggles, 
safety shoes or boots. No hazardous materials. Hazmat gear is reserved for hazmat technicians and specific hazmat response teams. You should, however, have equipment for work areas located in a waterproof compartment outside the patient compartment, including warning devices that flash or have other reflectors. You also need two high-intensity recharging battery-powered stand-up halogen 20,000 candle power flashlights. You can also have and need to have a typical ABC fire extinguisher, dry chemical with a five pound minimum, hard hats or helmets with face shields or safety goggles, portable floodlights. You need to also make sure that you have pre-planning and navigation guides. GPS devices and MDTs are standard equipment in modern ambulances. You need to make sure you have stored directions to key locations, such as local hospitals, in your GPS. Keep detailed street and area maps in the driver's compartment, just in case your GPS device fails. It does do that. So make sure you have regular maps as well. Make sure to familiarize yourself with the roads and traffic patterns in your town or city plan alternative routes to frequent de destinations, and be familiar with special facilities and locations within your regional operation area. You should also have a set of extrication equipment. This should be located in a weatherproof compartment outside the patient compartment, and it should contain equipment that is needed for simple light extrication, even if an extrication and rescue unit is readily available. Table 37-5 lists the items that should be included in this compartment. So that's table 37-5 in your text. As far as personnel are concerned, you need to have at least one EMT in the patient compartment during transport. Two EMTs are strongly recommended, however. Some services allow non-EMT drivers with two EMTs in the patient compartment. So be aware of your local protocols and laws. Your rig should undergo a daily inspection. Items included in ambulance inspection should be fuel, oil, and transmission fluid levels, engine cooling, batteries, brake fluid, engine belts, inflation pressure of wheels, and tires, including the spare, and any signs of unusual or uneven wear. All interior and exterior lights need to be checked, windshield wipers and fluid, horn and siren, air conditioners, heaters, and ventilation system, and the ability of the doors to open, close, latch, and lock properly. You need to check communication systems, vehicle, and portable. And you need to, as far as cleanliness and positions of all windows and mirrors is important, and inspect the cleanliness, quantity, and function of medical equipment and supplies, including your oxygen supplies, jump kit, splints, dressings and bandages, backboards, and other immobilization equipment, emergency obstetric kits, all battery-powered equipment, e.g. AED. All of the things we've been talking about in all of these slides leading up to this. As far as safety precautions, you need to review standard safety traffic rules and regulations. Make sure safety devices, such as seat belts, are in proper working order. Oxygen tanks must be secured by fixed clasps or housings, and all equipment in the cab, rear, and compartments must be stored and secured appropriately. Let's move on to the dispatch phase. Dispatch must be easy to access and in service 24 hours a day. It may be operated by local EMS or by a shared service with law enforcement and the fire department. The dispatch center might serve only in one jurisdiction or it might be in an area or a regional center. The dispatcher should gather and record the nature of the call, the caller's name, present location, and callback number, exact location of the patient or patients, that's the most important, the number of patients and the severity of their conditions, as much as they know, any other pertinent information that they may also have. En route to the scene. In many ways, the en route to the scene phase is the most dangerous phase for EMTs. Crashes cause many serious injuries, so make sure to fasten seat belts and shoulder harnesses before moving the ambulance, review dispatch information, and prepare to access and care for the patient. Assign specific duties and scene management tasks, and decide which equipment should be taken initially. 
en route. At arrival at the scene, if you're the first to arrive, you will perform a scene signs up and give a brief report of your findings to dispatch. Use the following guidelines. Look for safety hazards to yourself, your partner, any bystanders, and the patient. Evaluate the need for additional units. Determine the mechanism of injury of nature or nature of illness. Evaluate the need for spinal immobilization. Make sure to follow standard precautions. For mass casualty incidents, you need to estimate and communicate number of patients to the incident commander. Request additional units through dispatch. And the incident command system will be established defining each responder's role in the response. As far as safe parking is concerned, pick a position that will allow for efficient traffic control and flow around an emergency scene. The first vehicle to arrive should park 100 feet before or past a crash scene to create a barrier between EMTs and traffic. Do not park alongside a scene. You may block the movement of other emergency vehicles. Park uphill and or upwind of a scene with smoke or potentially hazardous materials and leave your warning lights or devices on. Keep a safe distance between your vehicle and operations at the scene. This figure shows safe parking distances for the ambulance. It also shows um, fire trucks, so it kind of gives you an idea of the entire scene and how traffic flows around the way the emergency vehicles are parked. Make sure to stay away from fires, explosion hazards, downed wires, and unstable structures. Set the parking brake. Park as close to the scene as possible to facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. If it is necessary to block traffic to unload equipment or load patients, do so quickly and safely. As far as traffic control at the scene, only when all patients have been treated and the emergency situation is under control should you be concerned with restoring the flow of traffic. Traffic control is intended to ensure an orderly traffic flow, warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. As soon as possible, place warning devices such as reflectors on both sides of the crash. The transfer phase. In most cases, excessive speed is unnecessary and dangerous and may prevent the provider in the back of the ambulance from rendering appropriate care as well as harming and alarming the patient. Use common sense and defensive driving techniques and the patient must be packaged for transport. Secure the patient to a backboard scoop stretcher or wheeled ambulance stretcher. Properly fit the patient into the patient compartment. Secure the patient with at least three straps across the body. Use declaration or stopping straps over the patient's shoulders especially if the patient is lying flat or is secured to a backboard. Continuing in the transport phase, make sure to provide dispatch with the following information when you are ready to leave the, with the patient. Give them the number of patients, give them the name of the receiving hospital, and the beginning mileage of the ambulance. In some jurisdictions, that's required. Make sure to monitor the patient's condition en route. Recheck a stable patient's vital signs every 15 minutes. Recheck an unstable patient's vital signs every 5 minutes. Contact the receiving hospital. Do not abandon the patient emotionally. Make sure to be aware of the patient's level of need. With the delivery phase, inform dispatch as soon as you arrive at the hospital. Report your arrival to the triage nurse or other arrival personnel. Physically transfer the patient, present a complete verbal report, complete a detailed patient care report, give a history of current illness or injury, and pertinent positives and negatives. Also, include the nature of the illness or mechanism of injury, relevant past medical or surgical history, medications and allergies, pre-hospital treatment and its effect on the patient. After transferring the patient, it may be possible to restock items during the call, like, such as oxygen masks, dressings, bandages. Sometimes you can also exchange sheets and things like that. En route to the station, inform dispatch whether you are in service and where you're going. 
As soon as you're back at the station, clean and disinfect the ambulance and equipment if not already done at the hospital. Restock supplies if not already done at the hospital as well. The post-run phase. Make sure to complete and file any additional reports and again inform dispatch of your status, location, and availability. Perform routine ambulance inspections and refuel your vehicle. Some key terms of the post-run phase. Cleaning, the process of removing dirt, dust, blood, or other visible contaminants from a surface or equipment. Disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by directly applying a chemical made for that purpose to a surface or equipment. High-level disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by the use of potent means of disinfection. And sterilization is a process such as use of heat that removes all microbial contamination. That would be one example would be like an autoclave. After each call, perform the following regimen. Strip used linens from the stretcher and place them in a plastic bag or designated receptacle. Discard medical waste such as disposable equipment used for patient care during the call in the appropriate receptacle. Wash contaminated areas with soap and water or disinfectant. Disinfect all non-disposable equipment that's been used for patient care during the call. Clean the stretcher with an EPA registered germicidal slash virucidal solution or bleaching water at a 1 to 100 dilution. That's one part bleach to 100 parts water. Clean spillage or other contamination with the same germicidal or virucidal solution or bleach water solution. Remember that things like Purell, things like that, they're antimicrobial, they're not antiviral. So you need to make sure you use germicidal slash virucidal solutions. Because many viruses survive outside the body on their own for days, weeks, or even years. It depends on the pathogen. So make sure you're using germicidal slash virucidal solution or bleach water solution. And the reason bleach is important is it kills everything. Literally everything. Everything microbial, bacteria, whether it's bacterial or virus. Create a schedule for the routine for full cleaning of the emergency vehicle and refer to the manufacturer's recommendations to create a written policy or procedure for cleaning each piece of equipment. Defensive ambulance driving techniques. Here's an ambulance crash that, that could, probably could have been prevented. So according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, between 1992 and 2011, there were approximately 4,500 motor vehicle traffic crashes involving an ambulance each year. Some of these accidents were fatal. And an ambulance involved in a crash delays patient care at a minimum and at worst may take the lives of EMTs, other motorists, or pedestrians. You're strongly encouraged to participate in a certified defensive driving program before attempting to operate an emergency vehicle. And in fact, in some states, that's actually the law. You have to go through it. With driver characteristics, some states require drivers to successfully complete an approved emergency vehicle operations course. That's what I was just referring to. Physical fitness and alertness are necessary to properly operate an emergency vehicle. You should not be driving if you take medications that can cause drowsiness or slow your reaction time. If you've been drinking alcohol or if you've been working long shifts, or multiple consecutive shifts. Notify your employer if you have worked a shift previously and feel unsafe to safely operate an emergency vehicle. Emotional maturity and stability are also necessary to operate under stress. You cannot drive in any manner that pleases you simply because you have lights and sirens on. You must operate the vehicle with due regard for the safety of others and preservation of property and I might underscore that with preservation of life. Safe driving practices. Speed does not save lives. Good care does. All drivers and passengers must wear seat belts and shoulder restraints at all times. If you remove your seat belt to provide care, fasten it again as soon as possible. Unrestrained or improperly restrained patients and equipment may become airborne during a collision.
Become familiar with how your emergency vehicle accelerates, corners, sways, and stops under various conditions. Make sure you understand the vehicle's braking characteristics and the best downshifting techniques. In multi-lane highway, stay in the extreme left hand of fast lane, allowing other motorists to move over to the right lane when they see or hear you approach. Siren Risk Benefit Analysis The decision to activate the emergency line in the sirens will depend on several factors. These are established by local protocols, patient condition, and anticipated clinical outcome of the patient. Driver Anticipation so make sure you always assume that motorists around your vehicle have not heard your siren or public address system or have not seen you until proven otherwise by their actions. If a motorist yields the right of way, the emergency vehicle operator should attempt to establish eye contact with the other driver. Look at the direction of the driver's vehicle front tires to get an early indication of which way it'll turn. And always drive defensively. Don't assume they're always going to move to the right. Sometimes they panic and freak out and just want to steer away and they'll sway to your left and you end up clipping them in the rear. So uh, be aware of that. Excessive speed. Excessive speed is unnecessary, dangerous, and does not increase the patient's chance of survival. It also makes it very difficult for EMTs to provide care in the patient compartment. It also hinders the driver's reaction time and increases time and distance needed to stop the ambulance. With siren syndrome, this causes drivers to drive faster in the presence of sirens due to increased anxiety. Although a siren signifies a request for drivers to yield the right of way, they do not always do so. Now let's also talk about vehicle size and distance judgment. Awareness of your emergency vehicle size and weight improves your driver's ability to manu maneuver excuse me, and judge distance. Crashes often occur when the vehicle is backing up. Always use someone outside the ambulance as a ground guide when you're backing to avoid any incidents. Vehicle size and weight greatly influence braking and stopping distances. Now let's talk about road positioning and cornering. Road position means the position of the vehicle on the roadway relative to the inside or outside edge of the paved surface. To keep the ambulance in the proper lane when turning a corner, enter high in the lane when turning a corner to the outside and exit low to the inside. Weather and road conditions. Ambulances have longer braking time and stopping distances than a civilian car. The weight of the ambulance is unevenly distributed, which makes it more prone to rollover. Remember, your cab, despite you, patient and EMT equipment being in there, generally is less heavy than the front driver compartment. So it is uh, unevenly distributed weight, and it will roll over, and it's got a high profile. So you've got wind uh, that can roll it over, and excessive speed in a high wind is a sentence for a rollover. As far as laws and regulations are concerned, although emergency vehicle drivers are exempt from normal vehicle operations during a call, certain laws and regulations must be followed. Motor vehicle crashes account for a large number of lawsuits against EMS personnel and services. If you are on an emergency call and are using your warning lights and siren, you may be allowed to do the following. Park or stand in an otherwise illegal location. Proceed through a red light or stop sign, but never without stopping first. Drive faster than the posted speed limit. Drive against the flow of traffic on a one-way street or make a turn that's normally illegal. Travel center of the left, or left, travel left of center to make an otherwise illegal pass. An emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass a school bus that has stopped to load or unload children and is displaying flashing red lights or an extended stop arm. Use of warning lights and sirens is governed by three basic principles. The unit must be on a true emergency call to the best of your knowledge. Both audible and visual warning devices must be used simultaneously. The unit must be operated with due regard for the safety of others. Right-of-way privileges. 
State motor vehicle statutes or codes offer often grant emergency vehicle the right of, to disregard the rules of the road when responding to an emergency. In doing so, the operator of the emergency vehicle must not endanger people or property under any circumstances. Get to know your local right-of-way privileges and exercise them only when it's absolutely necessary for the patient's well-being. Use of escorts. Use police escorts as a guide only when you are in unfamiliar territory. Neither vehicle should use its warning lights or siren. If you're being guided, follow at a safe distance. Also be aware of intersection hazards. Intersection crashes are the most common and usually the most serious type of collision in which ambulances are involved. Always be alert and careful when approaching intersections. If you are on an urgent call and cannot wait for the traffic lights to change, come to a brief stop at the light and check for other motorists and pedestrians before proceeding. On highways, shut down emergency lights and sirens until you've reached the far left lane. On unpaved roadways, take special care. Oper operate the vehicle at lower speed and maintain a firm grip on the steering wheel. With school zones, it's unlawful for an emergency vehicle to exceed the speed limit in a school zone regardless of the condition of the patient. Distractions that can occur. While an ambulance is in motion, focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards. Minimize distractions from mobile dispatch terminals and GPS, mounted mobile radio, any stereo, cell phone, or eating and drinking. If you're driving alone, when driving alone, it is your responsibility to focus on or figuring out the safest on route or safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Such situations demand your complete attention and focus. Now let's talk about fatigue. Recognize when you're fatigued and alert your partner or supervisor. If you're feeling fatigued, you should be placed out of service for the remainder of the shift or until the fatigue has passed and you feel capable of operating the vehicle safely. Now let's talk about air medical operations. Air ambulances are used to evacuate medical and trauma patients. Fixed wing units are used for inter-hospital patient transfers over distances greater than 100 to 150 miles. Rotary wing units, helicopters, are more efficient for shorter distances. There are especially trained crews that accompany aircraft and air ambulance flights. The MT's duties are limited to providing ground support, so familiarize yourself with capabilities, protocols, and methods for accessing helicopters in your area. Helicopter medical evaluation operations are happening when the med medical evaluation or medevac is performed exclusively by helicopters, and medevac capabilities, protocols, and procedures vary between EMS systems, so make sure you know your local protocols. When calling for a medevac, why call for a medevac? The transport time on the hospital by ground is too long considering the patient's condition. That should be your primary concern. Or it could be that road traffic or environmental conditions prohibit the use of a ground ambulance. This also is if the patient requires advanced care beyond EMT capabilities, such as pain medication administration or airway insertion. There are multiple patients who can overwhelm resources at a hospital reachable by ground transport. Who receives medevac? Patients with time-dependent injuries or illnesses, patients suspected of having a stroke, heart attack, or serious spinal cord injury, patients who are found in remote areas and have experienced scuba diving accidents, near drownings, or skiing and wilderness, or excuse me, wilderness accidents. Also, uh, air medical operations are there for trauma patients, candidates for limb replantation, a burn center, hyperbaric chamber, or venomous bite center. Whom do you call? Generally, the dispatcher should be notified first. In some regions, EMS may be able to communicate with the flight crew after initiating the medevac request. Establishing a landing zone. The safest and most effective way to land and take off is similar to that used by fixed wing aircraft when you're preparing for an air ambulance helicopter. Landing at a slight angle allows for safer helicopter operations. 
Establishing the landing zone is the responsibility of the EMS crew. So an appropriate site for a landing zone should be a hard or grassy level surface 100 by 100 feet, which is recommended, but no less than 60 by 60 feet. It requires a minimum of that for rotor clearance. Also, because of rotor disturbance and turbulence, it must, the area must be cleared of loose debris such as branches, trash bins, flares, accident tapes, medical equipment, and supplies. And it should be clear of overhead or tall hazards such as antennas, trees, telephone poles, etc. Mark the landing site using weighted cones or emergency vehicles positioned in the corners of the landing zone with headlights facing inward to form an X. Never use caution tape or ask people to mark the site. Do not use flares. They'll blow away and cause a fire. Move non-essential and persons and vehicles to a safe distance outside the landing zone. Communicate the direction of strong wind to the flight crew. They may request you create some form of wind directional device to aid their approach, like as a temporary wind sock. They're not that hard to make. Landing zone safety and patient transfer. Make sure to stay away from the helicopter and go only where the pilot or crew member direct you. Keep a safe distance from the aircraft when it's on the ground and hot, which means the helicopter blades are spinning. Stay outside the landing zone perimeter unless directed to come to the aircraft specifically by a member of the flight crew. If you're asked to enter the landing zone, stay away from the tail rotor. The tips of the blades are moving so rapidly they are invisible. Always approach the helicopter from the front even if it's not running. When you approach the aircraft, walk in a crouched position because the top rotors actually hang downwards. You can't see it, especially when they're moving quickly, but they hang downwards. So you need to make sure you're crouched so that the tips of the rotor blades don't get you. This figure shows the danger zones surrounding a helicopter. The danger is the main rotor bladers, uh, main rotor blades can dip as low as four feet off the ground, as I was just saying. So you approach in a crouched position, and also you want to watch out for the danger of the tail rotor, because the tail rotor blades move so quickly they literally are invisible. It they look like a solid piece spinning. So make sure that you follow directions of the ground crew and be aware of the hazards of the aircraft itself. Keep the following guidelines in mind when operating in a landing zone. Become familiar with your jurisdiction's helicopter hand signals. Do not approach the helicopter unless instructed and accompanied by flight crew. Make certain that all patient care equipment and patient are properly secured to the structure. Some helicopters may load patients from the side where others have a rear landing door. It just depends on the aircraft configuration. Any smoking, open flames, and flares are prohibited within 50 feet of the aircraft at all times. Do wear eye protection during approach and takeoff. Communication issues. In your medevac request, to prevent communication issues, include a ground contact radio channel and call sign of the unit that the medevac should make contact with. That's why you have numbers on the roofs of your rigs so that incoming aircraft uh, can see them. This figure shows hand signals used around helicopters. Moving right, moving forward, moving rearward, upwards, downwards, and moving left. So become familiar with these and practice them and practice them with a the teammate. Other special considerations include night landings. Do not shine spotlights, flashlights, or any other lights in the air to help the pilot because they may temporarily blind the pilot. Direct low intensity headlights or lanterns toward the ground at the landing site. Illuminate overhead or illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions if possible, if they're around. And make sure that the crew is aware of them. If you're if the helicopter is having to land on uneven ground, uh, use extra caution. Remember the main rotor blade will be closer to the ground on the uphill side, and you already know it can dip as low as four feet, depending on a lot of factors. So approach the aircraft from the downhill side only or as directed by flight crew. Medevacs at hazmat incidents. Immediately notify the flight crew of presence of hazmat at the scene. Consult the flight crew and incident commander about the best approach and distance from the scene for medevac. 
The landing zone should be uphill and upwind from the hazmat scene and properly decontaminate patients before loading them into the helicopter. Other medevac issues include the following. Factors to influence the decision to request a medevac. So do that by assessing the severity of weather or environment and terrain because helicopters are typically unable to operate in severe weather conditions such as thunderstorms, blizzards, and heavy rain. Most helicopter services are limited to flying at 10,000 feet above sea level, and medevac helicopters fly between 130 and 150 miles per hour. There are also issues because of the cabin's confined space, so assess the number and size of the patients who can be safely transported in a medevac helicopter. Typically, medevac flights are extremely expensive compared to ambulance transports, so the decision to request a medevac should not be based on the perceived ability of the patient to pay the bill, but rather on medical necessity for their life. So let's go over the review for this chapter. And we'll go to question number one. All the following are examples of standard patient care transfer equipment, except Stokes baskets, long backboards, wheeled stair chairs, or wheeled ambulance stretchers. You should get this one pretty easily. It is A. Each ambulance should carry a primary wheeled ambulance stretcher, a wheeled stair chair for use in narrow spaces, a long blackboard and short backboard, or a short immobilization device like a KED. A Stokes basket, also called a basket stretcher, is a specialized piece of equipment that is used for moving patients up or down rough terrain. And most ambulances do not carry Stokes baskets. They are usually carried by rescue vehicle or fire apparatus. So we've gone over all the correct answers and incorrect answers in answering uh, the correct answer, which is A, Stokes baskets. Those are not carried on ambulances. However, long backboards are standard piece transfer equipment, as are wheeled stair chairs and wheeled ambulance stretchers. Question two, the primary of a jump kit is to A, ensure you have immediate access to the AED, B, have available all the equipment you will use in the entire call, C, have easy access to manage patients with severe and controlled bleeding, or D, have available all the equipment that will be used in the first five minutes. If you think of why it's called a jump kit, you should get this answer quite easily and remember it from the slide we reviewed. It is D. Think of a jump kit as the five minute kit containing anything you need in the first five minutes with the patients. It is this first five minute period where you'll find and manage any immediate life threats. So look, look at the incorrect answers. A, ensure that you have immediate access to AED. A jump kit should have the basic equipment to treat immediate life threat. BLS care can be initiated until an AED arrives or ALS arrives, but you should have an AED on the ambulance anyway. B, have available all the equipment you will use in the entire call. That's not correct either because you need only the equipment to manage immediate life threats during the first five minutes. Afterwards, additional equipment can be brought into the scene. C, have easy access to manage patients with uncontrolled bleeding. Well, that's partially correct because a jump kit should have basic equipment to manage all immediate life threats, including airway and breathing. But D is the most correct answer. It has all of the available equipment that will be used in the first five minutes. Number three, you've been dispatched to a call for an unresponsive patient. What is the most important information you should obtain from the dispatcher initially? A, the callback number of the caller. B, the severity of the patient's problem. C, whether the patient is breathing. D, the exact physical location of the patient. It is D. All of the choices listed in this question are important questions to ask the dispatcher. However, you must first determine the exact location of the patient. You cannot help the patient if you cannot find them. While en route, you should try to ascertain any specific information you can possibly glean, such as whether the patient's breathing at conscious or semi-conscious, have they become conscious, etc. Since we reviewed the correct answer and the incorrect answer here, in other words, all of these are things you should ask, but again, the most correct answer is on the following slide, and that is correct answer D. You need the physical location of the patient. You need all the other information too, but first you have to be able to find them.
Question four. While en route to a call for a major motor vehicle collision, the most important safety precaution or precautions that you and your partner can take is or are A. Adhering to standard precautions B. Ensuring the fire department arrives before you C. Using lights and siren and being aware of other drivers or D. Wearing seatbelts and shoulder harnesses at all times This should be pretty easy. It's D. The en route to the scene phase of the call is most dangerous. Regardless of the nature of the call to which you're responding, wearing seatbelts and shoulder harnesses is the most important safety precaution that you and your partner must take. Furthermore, you must drive defensively and wear, be aware of the traffic around you. We'll look at the incorrect answers. Uh, then let's review the question. While en route to a call for a major motor vehicle collision, the most important safety precaution or precautions that you and your partner can take is or are A. Adhering to standard precautions. That's what takes place once you arrive at the scene where you're using masks, gloves, goggles, etc. Those are your standard precautions. B. Ensuring fire department arrives before you. It is important to know if they're responding, but it's not the most important safety precaution. In other words, it's not a prerequisite that they're there before you. C. Using lights and sirens being aware of other drivers. While the use of lights and sirens add to the risk potential, but the use of safety devices is the most important precaution take you can take, and that is D. Wearing seatbelts and shoulder harnesses at all times. That is your correct answer. Question 5. Which of the following is not a guideline for safe ambulance driving? A. Always use your siren if you have emergency lights on. B. Always exercise due regard for person and property. C. Use one-way streets whenever possible. Or D. Go with the flow of traffic. If you think back to the defensive driving we covered, you should be able to get this. It is C. Avoid one-way streets. They may become clogged and there may not be anywhere for traffic to move to get out of your way. So do not ever go also against the flow of traffic on a one-way street unless it's absolutely necessary. Number five, which of the following is not a guideline for safe ambulance driving? Let's review the incorrect answers. A, always use your siren if you have emergency lights on. That is a guideline for safe driving. B, always exercise due regard for person and property. That's also correct. That is a guideline for safe driving. C, use one-way streets whenever possible. That is the correct answer because that is a not a guideline for safe ambulance driving and you absolutely want to avoid it unless it's your only option. Or D, go with the flow of traffic. That is a guideline for safe ambulance driving. Question six, at what speed will the ambulance begin to hydroplane when there's water present on the roadway? 25 miles per hour, 30, 40, or 50 miles per hour? It is B. At speeds of 30 miles per hour or greater, the tires can lift off the pavement as water piles up under the tires. This takes control out of the driver's hands. If hydroplaning occurs, you should gradually slow down instead of jamming on the brakes to avoid losing control of your vehicle. Also, just take your foot off the gas immediately and uh, almost let the vehicle steer itself through, through the hydroplane. But take your foot off the gas and brake very gently if you have to brake at all. Usually if you take your foot off the gas and slow the vehicle down don't like that, you don't ever have to touch the brakes at all. So that's something you need to be aware of and possibly go to the skid pad. Ask your um, company if you can go to the skid pad and get some hydroplane training. It's extremely helpful. Let's look at incorrect speeds. Um, A, 25 is below speed where risk of hydroplaning exists. B is the correct answer, 30 miles per hour. 40, that exceeds the speed at which hydroplaning occur. And 50 exceeds the speed at which hydroplaning can occur. However, I can tell you that it can occur uh, at a higher speed as well. But the minimum speed where it's going to find you most vulnerable initially is 30 miles an hour. So just be aware of that. Number seven, the most common and often serious ambulance crashes occur on or at A, stoplights, B, intersections, C, highways, or D, stop signs. This one should be absolutely easy. 
It is B. Most ambulance crashes occur at intersections. Always be alert and careful when approaching an intersection. Whether at an intersection with stoplights or stop signs, you, sh you should momentarily come to a complete stop, look in both directions for other motorists or pedestrians, and then carefully proceed through the intersection. Take for example, there might be a pedestrian who's completely deaf, who has their back to you and doesn't see your wigwags and lights, doesn't hear your sirens at all, who has no idea you're there. And you go busting through the intersection. So, uh, you know, there are a million different scenarios, but um, intersections are always an issue. Um, people are moving through on a green light and you're approaching from a side and they can't see you possibly because buildings are shrubbery. So intersections should always be treated with very high regard because that's where most accidents occur. Let's look at the incorrect answers. The most common and often serious crashes occur at A stoplights while they're associated with an intersection. So the ambulance must come to a complete stop since most cars accidents occur at intersections. But it's not just stoplights, it's really B intersections. It could be stoplights or stop signs. So any intersection, whether it's lighted or signed. So that's why that's the most correct answer. C highways. That's not the most common site of ambulance crashes. Uh, D, stop signs, they are associated with intersections. Again, the answer, the most correct answer is intersections, whether it's lighted or signed. The recommended dimensions for a helicopter landing zone are 50 by 50, 75 by 75 feet, 100 by 100 feet, or 150 by 150 feet. This one you should remember easily. It is C, recommended dimensions for a helicopter landing zone or 100 by 100 feet on a hard or grassy surface that is level, is as level as possible. The landing zone should be clear of loose debris and power lines and overhead hazards. Um, you can go to 60 by 60, but that would be only if an extreme zero option. So um, find an area that's at least 100 by 100 feet. I'm not going to go over the incorrect answers because we know why they're incorrect. Number nine, which of the following statements about helicopters is true? A, it is possible that the main rotor blade will dip to within four feet of the ground. B, a helicopter is considered hot when it's on the ground and the rotors are still. C, if the helicopter must land on a grade, you should approach from the uphill side. Or D, if you must go from one side of the helicopter to the other, the best way is to duck under the body. So remember which of the following statements is true. Now think about these logically and you should get the correct answer easily. It is A. Because the main rotor blade of a helicopter is flexible, it can dip as low as four feet from the ground. So use extreme caution when approaching a helicopter with the rotors on and you will not be able to see it coming at you if it's low like that. It's moving at a speed that uh, causes an optical illusion and you can't see it. You don't realize it's that low. So use extreme caution when approaching a helicopter with rotors on. If a helicopter must land in a grade, approach it from the downhill side. If you're moving from one side of the helicopter to the other, move around the front of the aircraft, never under it and absolutely not behind it because of the rear, t rear um, uh, tail rotor and then also you have exhaust ports. So never ever go behind the aircraft when it's in operation ever. Don't ever go behind it anyway. So I'm not gonna cover the incorrect statements because they're all ludicrous and we know why they're incorrect. And we reviewed them by going over correct procedure just now. Number 10, upon arriving at a scene where hazardous materials are involved, you should park the amb ambulance upwind from the scene, B with the warning lights off, C downhill from the scene, or D, at least 50 feet from the scene. Think about what you know about hazardous materials. One of the things that makes them hazardous is many of them lie low to the ground or are moved by the wind. So that should give you the most logical answer pretty easily here. And it is A, at the scene of a hazardous materials incident, the ambulance should be parked uphill and upwind from the scene. Other locations may expose the ambulance to escaping hazmat material. So be prepared to quickly move the ambulance if the wind shifts in your direction. 
if you end up uh, staying in California, and if you lived here any length of time, uh, you know that wind shifts constantly in California. And there are other places in the country where it happens as well. But there are parts of the country where you have prevailing winds uh, that are consistent. So be aware of your local weather. Pay attention to it. Watch the Weather Channel and find out what it's going to be like. And if um, you're approaching a hazmat incident, you know, check check your weather on the way. And make sure you exactly know uh, what's going on at the scene. Let's look at the incorrect answers. With the warning light off, well, that doesn't make any difference one way or the other. Your goal is to park upwind and uphill. So warning light are based on departmental guidelines and have nothing to do with positioning the actual unit at a hazmat scene which should be uphill and upwind. Downhill from the scene. Of course you don't want to be downhill or downwind. Uh, and at least 50 feet from the scene. Well no. Parking upwind and uphill is your first priority and the distance is at least 100 feet. So um yeah, 50, that's why this is the incorrect answer. So, we have a lot to review in this chapter. There's ambulance operations. There's um, dealing with medevac. Um, there's ambulance stocking, proper stocking, proper um, securement of the patient, proper safety guidelines. So, there's an awful lot covered in this chapter. So, if you have to go back and review any slides, please absolutely do so. Review the tables in your text and or in this in the slide presentation. And thank you for your time and attention and we'll see you next class.